personally think Facebook, like, because, like, where would we actually be right now if it wasn't for Facebook? And this, this organization on the web, World Wide Web, is global on a global scale. And, you know, I think, I think when someone searches just Facebook itself, it might, I know there's a section and my computer's being slow again, but there's a section in here where you get to actually choose your um, your country but I look at Facebook like not just contained within the United States of America although you know some people might argue with that and you know in our time zone when I post something on Facebook it's according to our time zone in the United States of America. And it might be different timing in a different country. That's probably um, where our time's more ahead. No, behind than another country. So therefore, someone would probably try to take my ideas and... Um, maybe publish them in that country so they could appear to you know come out first or something but i think if you know the computer could actually analyze that and you know prove and that in fact um that i did it and um i mean that's the great thing about the internet today because honestly let's let's think this through okay you have um like invent help I think it's like dot com or something and see right here you have invent help invent help and you guys probably recognize this uh this logo um I obviously can't pop it up by itself but um and then there's like in invent um USA or something like that or invent um, um, I don't know, there's a bunch of other ones like Patent USA or something. And see, the, the, the great thing about Facebook is that, you know, once you publish it, your post, it actually tells you the time that a post was published and the date. As opposed to you reaching out to one of these websites, it's just a website. And as a web developer or someone that knows the website business industry, you know that it, you know someone can easily get your idea, you know, send it somewhere else, and then write you back and be like, "Hey, you know, this invention's already been patented, in, you know, in this country." And that's what probably did happen back in the days um but you know i think that you know i'm here to tell you that um that you can indeed do poor man patents through facebook and um without paying any money it's just like you you know writing your own patent and doing a poor man's patent by mailing that letter out and the description of it to the post office with your incorrect address and then um or mailing it to yourself and then that letter will get back to you it has the um return to sender um postage on it or it just arrived at your location and actually shows the time and date and then inside the letter you just never open it you put that away and then if you ever go to court well it's 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 it's, it's a federal stamped um envelope with documentation in there proving that in fact you invented that idea at this time on this date that they stamped it 
<laughs> and that's proof. So, if, you know, you go to court, the judge could open that up, look at the content within it, and then, you know, that'll, that'll prove that you indeed, you know, came up with the idea. And the great thing about, you know, with all this invention stuff is that, um, you know, in the internet is that a lot of these rich people won't be able to, um, you know, just take you out or like Mr. Wonderful says, just, you know, smash you like a cockroach, you know, because I believe that we're, we're all equal and, you know, you came up with an idea and it might be a great idea. But these other bigger sharks might want to take you out simply because, you know, I won't say that you're smarter than them if you're not making more money than them. Um, but I guess we're all smart in different ways. And, you know, a lot of these people probably came, you know, got where they are because other people put them there and other people helped them to be, you know, to become who they are. And, and they basically plug them in with the right people. So... You know, with, with this is, is um, you know, I wrote some notes here um, and see these inventions that that I basically came up with and I and I published. I mean, you know, like um, there is a Nikola Tesla. Nikola Tesla came up with a bunch of ideas, a bunch of inventions. But his downfall, if you guys go and look at his documentary, is that. He didn't care about his inventions and his ideas. He gave them away freely and didn't care about patents. And, you know, there's a um, a part in the documentary where he actually gives, like, I think he forgives Edison this huge amount of debt that Edison, Edison was in. And I think Edison would have gone out of business if it wasn't for Tesla ripping up those documents. And... Um, and then I think Edison, I mean, Tesla became very, very poor at the end of his life, as we know it. And, um, you know, I guess, see, but that's not really the the main focus. The main focus is, you know, if, if you're an inventor and you if you need money to create new products, new ideas, then obviously you're going to need money. You're going to need, like what people say uh, or call capital to bring these ideas to, to life and to introduce them to the market. Um, and you can't do that without any money. So that's why, you know, they're considered poor man's patents because you don't, you obviously don't have the money, but you came up with an idea to, you know, to make money and to introduce a new idea or make it, you made it better somehow, some way. And there's a bunch of kids doing this on around the world. And who knows, you know, if there's people out there stealing their ideas, you know, and being greedy and stuff like that. Um, so that's also a great thing about the Internet. And I believe that, you know, I think, you know, talking about God, uh, honestly, is, you know, God is awesome. You know, God, you know, loves everyone. And most of the people in, in the United States of America believe in God um, as Christians or whatever. Right. But we also got to remember that, you know, you know, if you guys already know the story, God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. And he died for us to forgive us our, for, for our sins, to forgive us of our sins. That's it. You know, like he didn't say he was going to think for us and reason for us and come up with inventions for us. Like he might give us the ideas and the thoughts to come up with ideas, but ultimately we have to do this we have to come up with ideas we have to take faith and 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 apply our actions and our deeds you know just like if you're going to open a door it's not just going to open up for you you know you can't just pray and expect god to open the door for you you have to grab the key and open it or turn the knob and open it you know in the same way with all these inventions and you know so th those are tools that help us out in our in our daily lives like a vehicle you know or like a toothbrush you know thank god for a toothbrush like you know we would have dragons still you know um thank god for you know cologne and and perfume and deodorant 
and all this other stuff, you know, that's uh, that's out there and available to us. Now, that's the invention stuff, and those are miracles alone from God to us to introduce to people and to the world. You know, now there there's there's also you know uh, not not neglecting the fact that you know God does perform miracles. And those miracles are unexpected miracles that, you know, si current science, um, new technologies, and current medicine just can't heal or um, restore a person back to health. So then that's when you really expect God and you pray to God to, to perform a miracle in someone's life or even in your own life that inventions simply can't reach out to and affect someone's life you know um so that's when you know you would really pray like if someone had you know has cancer or uh, is fighting some type of um life-threatening disease or something um or the doctor told them hey you only have a certain mean you know certain days to live or whatnot and you know the only avenue or the only option you have now is to pray and ask God to to heal you and there's a lot of people that are trained in this field and they actually pray you know like faithfully like like a job you know you don't like going to work you know you work eight hours a day right for some most people they work eight hours a day and you don't enjoy it you know it's just it's your job. You have to do it. And that's what the disciples did. They prayed every single day. Every single day. And they would break bread. And they would pray in tongues. And then I think they did this for like three years. And then they went out. And then they started reaching out to people. And healing the sick. And casting out demons. And a bunch of other things. Right? Um, which leads me to... Um, you know, there, there's people that are actually possessed by demons and these demons are, are what gives these people ideas and, and, you know, runs their lives. And obviously like the Bible says, you know, a person by their, by their fruit, you know, what they do and what they produce, what type of fruit they produce. And there was someone that told me a story where, you know, there's two men in the street as like a face off. But I think one of them was, I don't know if he was in his right state of mind. Maybe he was. Maybe he was intoxicated. I have no idea. But he said that there is a like another person there, which he later remembered or recalled that it was a demon, not an actual person. And there is, um, so there was actually four people there. There was a person f with him and there was a person with the other person that was arguing with him um, or something like that. And um, basically the, these demons were talking negative about each, you know, each, the, the two opponents that were there um and then the two demons which were obviously spiritual um were telling these two people and they're listening to their conversation so if someone said something this other person this demon would say something like oh see see like say this now like or you're really going to let him call you, you know, this? Or you're really going to allow him to say that? Or, ooh, ooh, what are you going to do about that? Oh, he did that? Ooh. So what are they doing? They're being, um, what is that word? Like, um, when people, like, want to start a fight, you know? intentionally with other people and that's what these demons were doing and and i don't know if you guys recall but in the in the 
New Testament, this happened a lot with with Jesus as well, when people would speak. And a good example of this um, was when Jesus, um, you know, told Mary, um, Jesus told Mary that he had to do the will of the Father, Scripture. So I don't really know where to find this, but I remember reading something about this. See, this, this is Luke chapter 2, verse 49. And basically, um, um, his parents were looking for... Jesus' parents were looking for Jesus. And he was at the temple or the synagogue, I forget. And he was like, you know, trying to find answers to to the scriptures and stuff like that. And and um, Mary had asked, um, um, and his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, son. Why were you searching for me? He asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? So. Right here. Um, oh no. Yeah, right here are these quotations. Mary asked. Jesus a question. That wasn't really derived from. Her own thought pattern in a way in her sense it was derived from you know like a a jealousy uh approach or or a um like something greedy like she just wanted him to be with her and her father and so that's why that's why she says, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. And Jesus said, don't you know I had, I had to be in my father's house? Um, and But they did not understand what he was saying to them. See, they didn't understand what, what, what he was saying. Why? Because um, they didn't understand because he knew... That it wasn't really them that were asking. It, it's an evil force. And Jesus understood this more as he grew up. That there is a spiritual enemy. And remember that that evil spirit was haunting them, uh, him and, and his parents. The day that they, they were... Uh, about to conceive Jesus, baby Jesus, and the wise men told the, one of the kings, or the king at that time, that, um, you know, that he wanted to go worship Jesus, but in fact, he wanted to go kill him, you know, and you guys know that part, so, you know, they were directed off for, you know, to a different direction or something like that, and and then there's other stories where angels would speak to, um, to, to these people and even Jesus to, to do certain things to escape from these, um, people or these evil spirits that were, you know, chasing him and looking for him to cause evil upon his life or in even his family's life. Um, here it says, why were you looking for me? He asked. Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? Um, so, um, I guess another one is what is it? Get behind me, Satan. And this was, but, or Jesus turned and said to Peter, remember, it's Peter, 
get behind me, Satan. See, in the quotations, it's right, or right here. Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. See, and in human speaking, um, what happened is that Peter had previously took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Um, and see, because Jesus was basically telling him, I must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Um, and basically, Peter was rebuking Jesus, saying, You know, never, Lord, it shall never happen to you. It should never, this should never happen to you. It, it will never happen to you. But in fact, it did happen. And because Jesus came on a specific mission, on a specific goal at hand, you know, and he was like a soldier, and he is a soldier sent directly, specifically from God the Father to the world to, to accomplish his specific tasks and then go right back. Like someone would in the military, you know, they, they were, they're giving specific instructions. They go and they do what they have to do and they come back mission accomplished. And of course, there's a lot of stories about that stuff, even in the Old Testament of the Bible. Um, so, see, and... You see this, like Gibi Hami saying, you are a stumble block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. And then you see this a lot in um, as the story um, unfolds. And there's actually, um, there's actually more accounts of this if you pay attention to them. There is actually when, um, who was it? Um, Judas Ascarit, um, Jesus' disciple, uh, dis, uh, betrays Judas Ascariot betrays Jesus scriptures see so right here it's gonna here's a summary from Wikipedia. uh it's gonna show the you guys um the gospel of Matthew 26 15 states that Judas committed the betrayal in exchange for 30 pieces of silver according to Matthew 27 1 through 10 after learning that Jesus was to be crucified Judas attempted to return the money he had been paid for his betrayal to the chief priest and committed suicide by hanging. Now, um, here, Judas betrays Jesus. And what I want to talk about is these people here that go and, and, and uh, speak with Jesus. Um, see, right here, see, then Satan entered Judas. See, this is very important. Now, the festival on, of, of, of unleavened bread, whatever this means, called the Passover, was approaching, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus, for they were afraid of the people. <laughs> the people, for we the people. Um, seeing these were 
chief priests and teachers of the law. They didn't like Jesus. They don't like his teachings. They don't like how he was disrupting the church and overturning the tables and accusing people of, you know, and forgiving sins and forgiving sinners. And he was providing a new way, a new way of, of life. And of course they were going to like that because Jesus was that ultimate sacrifice, that ultimate lamb. And that meant that a lot of people were going to go out of business. What are we going to do if we can't sell animals? What are we going to do if we can't do this or that? And that's how a lot of people are today with, you know, inventions in the internet. They were afraid about, oh, the, in, the, 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 the robots take over. What are we going to do for work and all that? It's all bogus, you know. God's going to provide one way or the other. So then Jesus entered Judas called his Karat, one of the twelve, and Judas Ascarat, one of the twelve, and Judas went to the chief priest and the office of the temple guard and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. They were delighted and agreed to give him money. He consented and watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them when no crowd was present. The Last Supper then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare it? They asked. He replied, As you enter the city, uh, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, The teacher asked, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with the disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished, make preparations there. See, so he knew the future. He knew all this stuff. Um, just like when Peter was going to deny him, or he did, he did deny him, he told him, prophesied over his life and said, you're going to deny me. And um, when you do the... The rooster, it's in a crowd like three times or something like that, and it did happen. Anyways, they left and found things just as, and you will probably get into that right now. And they left and found things uh, things just as Jesus had told them, so they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his disciples reclined on the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, a lot of the scriptures are like, <sighs> they're, they're too much. It's too much information, I know, uh, when I'm just trying to make a point. Um, and, but I'm going to continue in the same way after the sub, the supper, he took the cup saying, this is the, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with me, is with mine on the table. Is to betray me is with mine on the table. That's what the Bible says right here. The Son of Man will go on as it has been decreed, but woe to the man who betrays him. They began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was considered to be greatest. Jesus said to them, The kingdom of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you shall be like the young youngest and the one who rules like the one who serves for who is greater the one who is at the table or the one who serves it is not the one who is at the table but i am among you as one who serves you are those who have stood by me in my trials and i and i confer on you a kingdom just as my father conferred one on me so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of israel Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to shift 
all of you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. So obviously Jesus had, I mean, it says Satan had asked to shift all of you as wheat. So obviously he was speaking to Satan or something in this context. But he, but he replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. Then Jesus asked them, when I sent you without purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? Nothing, they answered. He said to them, but now if you have a purse, take it and also a bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. It is written, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment. The disciple said, See, Lord, here are two swords. That's enough, he replied. Jesus prays on the Mount of Olives. Um, so Jesus is basically going to pray that his suffering would not come upon him. And he's faced with this temptation to, you know, not go through this suffering and, and to bear the cross for us. And, but God has other plans and he basically, that's his whole mission is to die for us. So God basically allows him to be sacrificed as you guys already know the story. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives and his disciples followed him. One reaching the, the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw behind them, beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. And an, an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And he, in being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly. And, he, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from the from prayer and went back to the disciples he found them asleep exhausted from sorrow why are you sleeping and sorrow so they were crying why are you sleeping he asked them get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation jesus arrested so here it is where or i was trying to really get into while he was still speaking a crowd came up and the man who was called judas one of the twelve was leading them he approached jesus to kiss him but Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Jesus, when Jesus follow, when Jesus' followers saw what he was was going to what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, No, more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priest, the officers of the temple guard, and the elders who had come for him, Am I leading the rebellion that you have come with with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts, and you did not lay a hand on me. But this is your hour when darkness reigns. See? So, every day I was with you in the temple courts. And you did not lay a hand on me. But this is your hour when darkness reigns. See, so he wasn't really speaking to them. He was speaking to their enemies. Not his actual, not these um, temple core or priest enemies. I'm talking about the demons that were, um, that were possessing these men to attack Jesus you know because you know there's another scripture that says God um, is the light but the world loved darkness instead of the light um, you know so Peter disowns Jesus then seizing him see and there's a different uh, this is Luke the account of Luke this is not there's other accounts where, you know, more information is given. Um, see, where Jesus is arrested. Um, and I'm going to go quickly and 
maybe look for the account of Matthew. You know, Jesus arrested. Um, and this is Matthew's account from Matthew's testimony because there's four testimonies. There's the four Gospels of this testimony, which is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These are four disciples that gave four testimonies, four different accounts of what had happened at this time. So this is probably when they were arrested and tortured and all this other stuff. They probably got information out of them and asked them specific questions. Maybe. But anyway, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I give is the I get I kiss is the man arrest him. So Judas said this. Going out once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. So that's why Jesus in this account, Luke account, um, uh, are you, Judas, are you betraying Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? But Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? See, because right here it says um, that Judas had actually told the chief priests and the elders of the people that he would kiss the man um, they were to arrest. And then he obviously went up to Jesus and then Judas, Judas not only kissed him, he said, greeting rabbi, and kissed him. And that's when Jesus said that. See, and it's not even written here in this account. But if you put them together, it, it will make more sense. See, so there's a pattern or, or something like that, you know, that can actually be put together in in more clarifical, um, you know, modern society uh, reading Doc, like a documentation of that um, and it's all legal stuff you know but anyway it's like a legal case Jesus replied do what you came for friend then the man stepping stepped forward and sees Jesus and arrested him with that one of Jesus companions reached reach for his sword drew it out and struck the servant of the high priest cutting off his ear See, and right here doesn't say anything about him healing him. But Jesus said, put your sword back in its place. Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. See, in this account, Luke does not say that. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that, I, that say it must happen in this way? See, and so that's another um, section that could actually be compiled together for the clarification of the reader. In that hour, Jesus said to the crowd, Am I leading the rebellion that you have come out with swords and clubs, clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple, course teaching, you did not arrest me. But this has all taken place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. Now, that was Matthew's account. There's also uh, Mark, Mark's account, Mark's testimony. And it says, just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared with him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. To the one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. See, so it doesn't say arrest him, and or maybe it does. And it says lead him away under guard. See, so that's another key description of what was said by Judas. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, See, but the, this Matthew account says, greetings, rabbi. It doesn't just say rabbi. See, but these are four different accounts. So Mark obviously just heard rabbi when Judas kissed him. 
The man sees Jesus and arrested him. Then once, then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Am I leading a rebellion? Jesus said that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me. Every day I was with you, teaching in the temple courts, and you did not arrest me. But the scriptures must be fulfilled that everyone deserted him and fled. Then everyone, desert, uh, everyone deserted him and fled. A young man wearing nothing but a lining garment was following Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. Who this young man was, I have no idea. Um, but he was following Jesus when they seized him. And he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. Maybe as one of his disciples, I don't know. Um, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then there's John. Remember, that's that's the the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Um, and then it goes to like Acts and stuff like that. And then. Um, Romans or something like that. Anyway, see, there, so this is um, uh, John's uh, testimony. When he had fled praying, Jesus left with disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley, one of the other side. On the other side, see, so it gives specific details of where they were at. N not just um, the Garden of Eden, because Matthew... Um, previously, I believe, said that they were in the Garden of Eden. I mean, in the Garden of Eden, in the Garden. And Jesus was praying that the, um, the cup would pass over him. And then his disciples were there praying, but they were sorrowful, remember? And Jesus said, you guys can't even stay up and pray that you won't fall into temptation. So it, it says Jesus left with his disciples. So they were walking and crossed the Kedron Valley. On the other side, there was a garden, and he said, and he and his disciples went into it. Maybe, maybe it was this garden or another garden. I'm not sure. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place. Also, that was prior to him, Jesus going into the garden, you know, so, um, so to get into the garden, you know, so this is a puzzle, people, there's, see, there's no really no maps and stuff, you know, um, the disciples crossed the Kidron Valley, and on the other side there was a garden, so obviously on the other side of that, there is a garden, and the disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place, because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the garden, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, See, and he knew everything that was in, that was going to happen to him right here because he already, remember, he was in the garden. He was praying that this stuff would not happen to him because he was obviously a prophet. He was able to foresee the future. That's why he was able to tell Peter when the rooster crowds, you're going to deny me three times and a bunch of other um short-term prophecies or statements that Jesus said to people that actually came to pass um, a lot. Um, anyway, Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, who is it you want? See, because remember, he's fighting demons, you know, and he's fighting, he's in a battle, and God ultimately is trying to God is ult ultimately trying to restore the Garden of Eden back into the earth but we as humans don't want to understand that 
we don't want to um we don't we don't want anything to do with that you know it's better for us to just live life drink and you know have sex with all kinds of women you know who doesn't want to live like that you know everyone does you know deep down i think we all do you know but you know but i i guess that's the majority of the people not everyone's like that i think maybe you know but um I think the main thing is uh you know that people obviously today will laugh like ha 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 this is a joke I understand that you know because it's the bible like you know these people are going to church and believing in a god in a bible believing in a book and praying and you know believing all sorts of crazy stuff and nonsense but is it really nonsense is it really um just a book and a lot of people will uh, argue against that and obviously there's a lot of controversy um going on concerning that you know but i mean you know if you live in 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 society you have probably never really witnessed you know people that are really demon possessed and if you have probably at a small scale so of course it's going to be funny because we easily bypass it we easily say oh this person's crazy over here and we're hanging out with like-minded people so in our eyes, we think we're not even crazy. We're we're just doing our own thing. We're normal. Uh, who knows what these other people are doing? You know. So in that sense, yeah, you know, it could be funny. It could be very very funny. You know. But anyway, Jesus of Nazareth, and see, when when we are close to death there's a lot more that we're going to experience um and i don't say this lightly you know because you know honestly i was hearing voices personally and I thought I would never be, you know, I would never hear voices. I thought that was just for the crazy and insane. And never for someone that's normal. Or that's, you know, trying to do good in life or whatever. Maybe I was hallucinating. I still don't know to this day. Um, but maybe what caused it on a more logical ter like terminology is I remember I was doing window cleaning and I was doing pressure washing for residential homes and I remember I had gasoline in the back of the van and sometimes it would spill and I would smell it. It was very, very toxic. Maybe that could have caused it i to this day i still question a lot of this i i documented a lot of stuff you know maybe there's people out there that know more about this stuff than i do and that's why i documented it because you know like if, if that's something that you first i mean that something that you experience for the first time and then there's really no one there around you to talk to you about it. it it's it could be very scary, and you're just un, you're living in uncertainty. And what should I do in this situation? What can I do in this situation? You know, and all these things come up uh, on top of that, which you know put more and more stress and anxiety upon you.
But anyway, anyways, going back to this, so yeah, Jesus is basically fighting, not for his life, because God already told him, you know, that this cup is going to come upon you, and you are going to drink it, and you are going to die for, for all humanity as an ultimate sacrifice. So he's not fighting for his life. He willingly gave it up. That's why in Matthew, no, yeah, it says, put your sword in place, Jesus said, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call my on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? See, so Jesus could have ended it like that, but he chose not to. Because he had you and me and the whole world, us sinners together. The whole sin idea, he looked at that problem and he said, you know what? I'm going to put an end to this. And I'm going to make my father happy by laying my life for, for all mankind. That was the mission of Jesus. That's what he did. And that's what every... Christian believes that's what you know the Bible says about the free gift of salvation and you know John 3 16 and you know just go to church you know you hear it they'll they'll preach your years um, to death where you don't want to hear this stuff anymore like oh my god every year you know uh, Easter, the same message over and over and over. Like, it's ridiculous. Like, it's probably what the disciples probably considered milk and not solid food. Like, when are we gonna, when are we gonna move from this stage and move to a different stage? And if you're on that stage, when are you going to move up to a different stage or a different one than that? There's got to be basic training, basic training of the scriptures, and then more advanced after that, and more advanced after that, and more advanced after that. And thanks to the internet, we're becoming more and more organized. Thank God. But anyway, Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, he said, I am he, Jesus said. And Judas the traitor was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So you guys see here, none of this wasn't written in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It is only recorded in the Gospel of John. Again, he asked him, who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. So basically he was saying, you know, like, you know, you guys came here for me. Let these other people go. You know, so Jesus was looking out for, for his disciples. Because he already knew what these people were going to do to him. And maybe he didn't want that to happen to, the, to his disciples at that time and point of their lives. Because remember, there's still Judas still has to betray him according to what Jesus said. And then later in the scriptures, Jesus, you know forgives him and Judas no and then Pete Peter denies him and then Peter you know Jesus talks has his talk with him at in the spirit and forgives him and even gives him food and stuff 
And then Peter, in later on in scriptures, in the scriptures, in the story, in the timeline, he gets crucified. But he said something about, I'm not, I'm not worthy to be cru crucified like Jesus. So they flipped him upside down and crucified him in that manner. So imagine watching the Passion of the Christ all over again. But imagine this being Peter's life, him denying him. And then him getting whipped like Jesus did. Probably carry the cross as well. Because that was um, part of the execution for a prisoner back at that time. For breaking the law and stuff like that. For murderers and stuff like that. Because remember there's two people on the side of Jesus. And they had an argument like, you know, we are dying for our our murders or our crimes but this man in the center Jesus you know he has committed no crime but remember God said you know today you're gonna to be with me in paradise the other one said he said basically you're going to hell I think you know like I guess we all understood that see so it was just like um, like the electric chair or now in these days, the death penalty with the three lethal injections, which are like three, want to paralyze your whole body. They probably torture the crap out of them. And then there's a second needle. Who knows what that does? Probably like spider venom or who knows what else. Gangrene, something to torture them. And then there's a third one. And who knows how long this process takes. It could take days. It could take a day. It could take hours. It could take months. It could take years. Who knows? Who's really there to analyze this? You know? But anyway. So, yeah. You know, one way that they would punish prisoners at that time was that they would crucify them. And that's the way that they punish these people. So you guys could just realize how harsh it was for, for Jesus to get this type of treatment. You know, but Jesus just wanted God, in a way, just wanted to paint a different picture to all mankind. But we didn't understand it at that time. You know, it's just like right now, if we were killing animals for our sins, and then here comes a man that says, I'm the ultimate sacrifice. Just, you know, you guys are going to kill me, and you guys are not going to have to do all this anymore. Everyone will probably laugh and think it's a funny joke like Kevin Hart or George Lopez when they go up on stand. Or on stage, I mean. And... That's just the way that, you know, people just, they think everything's funny until their life is put on the line. But anyway, you know, that's just the way life is, though. You know, Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. If you are looking for me, then let these people go, these men go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I... Have, lo have not lost one of these you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it. See, and right here, John says, Who cut the, the, high, priest ser uh, the high priest servant? Um, um, you know, um, is the one that... Peter's the one that cuts the servant's... The priest servant's year off, right year. In verse ten, which these accounts um, don't. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. 
Then the man stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him without one of Jesus' companions reached out for his sword, reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. So this was Matthew. And he says one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword. See, so there's legal people need to come in here and really analyze this stuff, you know? Like, because one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword... It doesn't say one of the disciples or one of our friends. It says one of Jesus' companions, like if he wasn't one of Jesus' companions. Then one of those standing near drew his sword. That This is Mark's account. Mark 14, 47. Then one of, of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Luke. Um, but Jesus answered. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, and then Jesus, Jesus' followers saw what was go going to happen. They said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? See, so someone... Someone said, Lord, should we like fight? Should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. Um, Jesus answered, no more of this. He touched the man's ear and healed him. Um, then John, verse 10, John 18, verse 10 says, then, Peter, then Simon Peter, who had his sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, Cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. You know, so it, it says that Peter, who denied Jesus, um, Simon Peter, who who is in pretty soon going to be cutting off. I mean, denying Jesus. This is the man who cut the high priest um, year off. See, so, I mean, if you really want to study the Bible, you got to analyze all four testimonies. And I think the Catholic Church has, I think, a different um, gospel within it. So it can all also be cross-reference if you really want to know more about the Bible because if the Bible says you don't need any man to teach you because the Holy Spirit te teaches you all things and of course you're going to do it in a prayerful manner you're going to have to be educated in the scriptures and and obviously um, you yourself are going to have to be educated enough to discern what's right and what's not right and what's accurate or not accurate, or does this make sense? And evalu evaluate, an evaluation process would have to be conducted educationally without saying, oh no, that's, that's a different religion, and this is a different religion. But remember, as, I don't even have my Bible, but the, the Bible was compiled of 66 books. They left, that means that they left other books out, other scripts out. So only because they left, they only put certain books in there, that doesn't mean that's the complete and, and end of the story type of book. You know, like, I think that's the main focus. But if you're really hungry for more of God, I think there's more out there. And there's a lot of research on the web and and everywhere. And of course, a lot of people say like, well, you have to just be careful how you study because some people could tell you misguiding things. But I think if you remember, you know, and, and stick with the, what the Bible teaches. And if, you know, obviously if someone's trying to teach you to do anything 
like evil or whatever, then you will know about it, you know. And um, I don't know, like, so so. Anyway, there is other uh, recorded testimonies of this stuff. And my whole point in this is, you know, we just look at these four accounts when there is other, there's a, other groups of people. There's 12 disciples minus seeing one of them, which was Judas Ascra here, who, who was a traitor because he was standing right there. It says right here, and I am he, Jesus said, and Judas the traitor was standing there with them. Then Jesus said, I am he. Um, they drew back and fell to the ground. See, so Judas was there. He was one of the 12. He obviously didn't write a testimony because he went and committed suicide. He hung himself. So that leaves us with five people, five testimonies. Judas killed himself. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So that leaves us with seven other testimonies that Christians don't even care to ask. What happened to those testimonies? Are there even accounts of this? And if there is, where? And if they're available, how can I get a record of that so I could read it and, you know, study it for once because I'm a diehard Christian and I know the Bible left to write which like like it matters you know it's good it's good you know it's good that that you know scripture is good and all this and this and that but the disciples also understood this and they, they said that they don't need to come at people with fancy words and stuff like that like a YouTube person would or like a salesman would trying to sell you on an idea no they just they they were simple people just like you and i and they would simply share what was in their heart and they understood the scriptures they were walking with jesus so what they told them you know they understood and um they took it to heart. So it's important to know the Bible, yes. And, you know, there's so many things. And this is just the Bible. Like, there's so many things that, like, I want to talk about. But there's so many, there's so many, you know, um, industries in this world that I can't even start to talk about every single one of them. And, you know, like there's Mary, Mary, um, the one that gave birth to Jesus, you know, the angel came to her and said, hey, you're going to have Jesus and here you have it. You know, here's Jesus um, conceived of the Holy Spirit. And Mary says, yeah, let it happen according to your word, whatever. And, and it happens. Now, she couldn't go around telling everyone, hey, an angel came up to me and appeared to me and said, you know, and told me that I'm going to have a baby. Logically, you would be like, yeah, right. She was, she's either, you know, she was having sex out of marriage with Joseph, her, her fiance, or with another man. Because Joseph was going to divorce her secretly or like, you know, just have nothing to do with her secretly as the scriptures reveal. But then an angel appeared to him as well and said, you know, don't worry, don't trip. Like, you know, what what really happened to your, your fiance was really an act of God and an angel did come. And obviously he understood from that point on. And because he seen the angel and he seen the angel disappear or whatever. So he had confirmation. Or else he probably would have never believed it. And Mary would have probably been stoned to death. You know, because eventually people 
we're going to find out about what happened to Mary. And he probably wouldn't want anything to do with it. See, so... See, there's a lot of things in, in, in these other accounts that if you studied them and you told people about them of the, you know, from someone's point of view of just reading these four Gospels and then you came at them with new evidence or new statements that were made, like I was kind of showing you guys here, you know, like, like, for example, John's account, it says Simon Peter, who had drew, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. Uh, right ear. So, um, so see right here, it, it says clearly who did that. Now, other uh, gospels that are not in the Bible, but outside of it. But that that are the twelve disciples, or one of the twelve disciples, um, might have different statements like this, like facts, uh, or real evidence of what really went down. And then, you know, if you try to say that verbally to someone that just has the book of the uh, the Bible, the Holy Bible, that just goes to a Christian church, or even if you share that with a the pastor, they might be like, well, I never read that. You know, I never read these statements that you're saying or declaring. Like, prove it to me, show it to me. And then if you go and tell them, well, it's, it's um, one of the other disciples' um, a testimony, they might, you know, push you aside or criticize you for even going out there and looking and trying to educate yourself on wh what really went down, you know? So it's all about education. It's all about really knowing, you know, before judging anyone. Like when people say, you know, this person, you know this person went to heaven because he did this and this and this, but that's not necessarily true. That's why a priest or whatever would say would say more some more in the terms of may God have mercy on his soul. Not really getting into if he went to heaven or hell. Um and then there's a scripture that says, because God has no partiality, no favoritism. And then there's other scriptures that say it's going to be easier for a prostitute and a poor man to enter the kingdom of heaven than one who thinks is upright and righteous and that is rich. Now, I don't know what riches have to do with anything. But that's what it says, you know. See, and even that, I don't think riches are, are an evil thing because Solomon was the wealthiest person alive in the Old Testament. I guess it's how it's used. You know, so there, there's a lot of things that need to be considered and really, um, like, analyzed and, and studied. <sighs> Because there's another one that says that even the angels refuse to rebuke Lucifer or Satan. There's a reason why. Remember, he was the highest ranking official or angel in the angel race. Like the human race, but the angel race. So, obviously, they respect him and fear him. Where they're like, you know what? We're not going to say nothing about you. We're going to let God judge you. You know? And I guess it's easy for us to, to think we're holy and we're going to heaven and this and that. But we just never know. You know what I mean?
Anyway, Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's high priest servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Malchus. Oh, so he struck the high priest's servant. And the servant's name was Malchus. So it wasn't really the high priest who got his ear cut off. It was a servant. Jesus commanded Peter, Put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Then the detachment of soldiers with his commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law law of Sophia's the high priest that year Kafias or Sophia's was the one who had advised the Jewish leaders that it would be good if one man died for the people um see so anyways Jesus is obviously still fighting demons um um, and here Peter is, um, is, uh, is, is denying Jesus, Peter's second denial and third denials, the high priest questions Jesus, and I can read this, I guess, um, Peter's first denial, and Jesus actually witnessed some of these, and I guess I can read them since I'm already here. Why not? I, I mean, I wasn't really trying to read all this stuff, you know? I was just trying to prove a point that there's demons even today that are, that somehow have a, like a portal or a way of getting through us to hate other people and for other people to hate us. And I guess... Um, like, that's just part of the fallen state of mankind, you know, that from the point of the Adam, Adam and Eve, you know, I mean, even Jesus got crucified. So I guess, you know, we, we are all going to die too, one way or another. Anyway, Peter's first denial. Simon Peter, which is also the guy that cut the servant, the high priest servant's ear, as stated earlier, and another disciple were following Jesus because, and they were following him not noticeably but secretly, and you'll see why. Because this disciple was known to the high priest. He went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard, but Peter had to wait outside at the door. The other disciple, who was known to the high priest, came back, came, spoke to the servant girl on duty there, and brought Peter in. You are one of, the, of this man's disciples too, are you? She asked Peter. He replied, I am not. So right there, he denied Jesus. It was cold. And the servants and officials stood around a fire they had made to keep warm. So think about like a winter day. Maybe snow outside, maybe not. But it was cold. And the servants and officials stood around a fire. Bonfire, whatever. Probably smoking cigarettes, drinking beer, who knows. They had made to keep warm. Peter also was standing with them. War warming himself. The high priest questions Jesus. Meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. I have spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I was um 
I always taught in synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews came together. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those, ask those around, ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. When Jesus said this, one of the officials in Ebar slapped him in the face. Is this the way you answer the high priest? He demanded. If I said something wrong, Jesus replied, testify as to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him down to Sophias, the high priest. Peter's second and third denials. Meanwhile, Peter, Simon Peter was still standing there warming himself, so they asked him, you, are, you aren't one of his disciples too, are you? He denied it, saying, I am not. So right there, he denied him the second time. One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose year Peter, one of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man who whose ear Peter had cut off challenged him. Didn't I see you with him in the garden? Again, Peter denied it. And at that mo moment, a rooster began to crow. So right here, Peter denied it. That's the third time. And then in the Passion of the Christ, that's when... You know, Peter and Jesus look like, look out of eye. Jesus before Pilate. Then the Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas, Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning and to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, they did not enter the palace because they wanted to be able to eat the Passover. They wanted to feast. So Pilate came out to them and asked, What charges are you bringing against this man? If he was, if he were no, if he were not a criminal, they replied, We would not have handed him, him over to you. Pilate said, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone. To execute anyone they objected they wanted to execute them but we have no right to execute anyone they objected this took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death he was going to die Pilate then went back inside the palace summoned Jesus and asked him are you the king of the Jews So obviously, these men really wanted to get him killed outside of even their own jurisdiction. That's why they took him here with Pilate. That's why Pilate said, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. And then they said, but we have no right to execute anyone. They objected. This took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death he was going to die. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him. So he called him forth and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea? Jesus asked. See, so remember, there's demons that operate through people. And not like zombies and stuff, you know, but... he was. This was probably like a trick question. Are you... The king of the Jews. He wanted. He probably wanted him to say yes. Because Jesus was obviously no king. You know what I mean? And that's why Jesus said. Is that your own idea? Jesus asked. Or did others talk to you about me? See so they were plotting against him. And Jesus knew this. There is evilness going on behind the scenes. Am I a Jew? Question mark. Pilate replied. 
Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. See, so think about this, people. Jesus is not talking to Pilate directly. He's talking to... He is talking to a demonic force out there that was obviously trying to get him killed and assassinated. And right, like these other people said, but we have no right to execute anyone. They objected. They wanted to kill him. These people wanted innocent an innocent person to die. Because right here, Jesus is not really like answering Pilate's question. And it's very confusing. Like, if you heard someone say this, you would be like, what? Like, that's why, you know, Pilate said, am I a Jew? Pilate replied, your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Now, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, Pilate replied. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into this world or the, in, in, into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the, on the side of truth listens to me. See, this is the justice system. Jesus, God's justice system for mankind. Because remember, from the Adam, from the beginning of time, there's evil and good, truth and lies, or whatever. So that's why Jesus answered, You say that I am a king, in fact, the reason I was born. And because we really know this as. Well, the overall um, story of the Bible, we know Jesus is a king. And we know that his kingdom is not of this world. You say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the, on the side of truth listens to, to me. What is truth? Obviously, this guy didn't really know the mission. He doesn't really know what Jesus is really trying to do for mankind. What is truth, retorted Pilate? With this, he went out again to the Jews, gathered there and said, I find no basis for charge against him but it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the passover do you want me to release the king of the jews they shouted back no not him give us bar Bar barabbas now barabbas had taken part in an uprising so these people plotted all this out. They knew all this was going to happen because they had, you know, obviously spoken about it. And obviously they weren't in their own jurisdiction. That's why they took them to Pilate where they have di where they had different laws. And that's why they picked Jesus up that day, that very hour. See, so they had to contemplate this. This is like premeditated murder before it even happened and Jesus already knew all about it you know 
and that's that's it's powerful it's, it's a powerful um you know story that's unfolding here and um you know there's way more stuff and I know I've been talking for a long time, so I, I don't even know if this video is really going to like capture all these scriptures because it's been been buggy. So, you know, lately where it only gets my voice and not my, you know, the, the screen, the overall screen of my videos for some reason, I need help upgrading it or updating it or something. Jesus sentenced to be crucified. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. Just like any other prisoner, just like Barabbas would have been flogged if Jesus wasn't arrested. Or like Peter later on when he gets crucified upside down. That was part of their custom. He's a prisoner, he's going to be crucified, and all, before they're, they're crucified, they're going to get flogged, they're going to get beaten. And some of their punishment at that time was you know, 39 slashes to the back. Or if you were a thief, they would probably cut off your arm. Different things. You know, and that was there. It, it was an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. At that time. The soldiers twisted twisted together a crowd of th th thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in, purple, in a purple robe and went up to him again and again saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and they slapped him in the face. So these guys are obviously getting their revenge on Jesus and making a a clown out of him, if, if you want to say that. But peep game on this, people. This All this stuff here is, is significant. Is a future uh, prophecy of his later coming to back to earth. Now they what they did is they put a thorn, a crown of thorns on his head. So obviously Jesus is still gonna have a crown. Maybe not a spikes going in his head and stuff like that, but he, you know he has a crown. He, and they clothe him in, pur in a purple robe. So he's probably going to be wearing all purple as a sign of power. Even though these people were doing it ma maliciously and out of hatred. And it says, king, hell, king of the Jews. So people later on will probably be saying this. Hell, king of the Jews. When he comes back. You know, so all this has um, relevance to future events, and it's all connected, interconnected, and it's one big puzzle that is that will be put together, and it will make sense in a way because some of this stuff is everywhere, and people have to make sense of it all. Like what? And I remember when I started reading the Bible, I was I was lost. Um, but I, I kept studying, I kept reading, I kept, um, you know, like trying to figure everything out, but you know, there's still a lot of things I still don't know. And that's because I don't take the time to read it or I don't have a group of people who really want to sit down and really find something out. But I guess anything can be. You know, and I get talking about inventions and not to get off topic, but talking about inventions. I mean, I think a good medical one is when Jesus spits on the, um, on dirt on the ground and then he makes like clay out of it and then he puts it on a, on a man's eyes, probably outside of it. There's no telling if he allowed that to dry so it could so it was hardened before he went and washed. See, there's no really account 
about these certain things. But all we know is that Jesus spit on the ground, made like clay, put it on the man's eyes, and he said, go and wash it at this place. So he did, and then he came back seeing. Now, some people um, might argue that, you know, there's really no healing power in dirt and saliva. And, you know, especially with the ability to have someone see again, but we just never know, you know, and, and I guess, you know, it would be kind of weird to do that without people having really real faith. So someone really has to believe, you know, and just keep it a secret, obviously, until something really comes out and, um, and I could break through. And, you know, maybe, maybe there is some way of curing people that are blind maybe there already is i don't know um there's also another one in genesis and i think uh someone told me about this a close friend of mine told me that that a doctor or doctors eventually figured out that you know in genesis when god created man uh, which was uh, Adam, he put Adam in a deep sleep and took a rib out of him and put it in the woman Eve, which Adam later called woman, right? He has another story. But the interesting part about that was that God had put Adam in a deep sleep. So we know now that we have anesthesia. Anesthesia has the ability to put someone to sleep and to numb all pain. You know, there is no way God could have just opened up Adam and taken a rib or just taken a rib period without opening them up or something or something like that. You might. So it, it was basically a surgical procedure that took place, you know, and then so that's how they later found out that in order to perform a surgery, like when someone gets hurt or needs surgery for whatever reason, they put that person under, they put them to sleep, then they're able to go in there and do whatever they have to do. And and then boom, the person just wakes up. And that's what happened to, to Adam. And obviously, I don't know if it's overthinking things. I don't know if it's accurate or not. I, I mean... See, there's, there's a lot of details that were left out. and But see, that's why I bring this up. And there's a lot of other things. And if you read closely in the scriptures um, that are real um, miracles that took place. And I guess scientifically, like with medical and all that, Maybe we we can somehow um, bring some of these things where we're able to do stuff like that. Well, not Adam's ribs and all that, you know. But, I mean, I'm talking about, like, the blind eyes. And there is another guy with, a, you know, that had a sickness. Jesus healed him. Some guy had leprosy. God told him to go dip himself in the Jordan River or something like that. And it was like, a, I mean, I don't know if I'm saying the right river or not. But it was like a, a river where it was polluted and dirty, I think. And like no one wanted to go in there. But he did it anyway because that's what God said or Jesus said. So he went and he was healed. So maybe it was the algae, something in the algae in the water or something that healed this person. I don't know. But see, that's another one to look into. You know, and there's a bunch of other things. A bunch of other things. But I'm not even trying to talk about that as much. 
So, but I mean, I could get into it, but then I'll take up a lot of time, talk about it for a long, long time. So, anyways, I'm just going to continue to um, prove, prove my point about, you know, like, um, you know, these demons, you know, like talking to Jesus and then Jesus not really talking specifically to the people, but like to a outside source, a spiritual uh, force that was attacking them, you know, and I think that's the voices I've been hearing maybe, you know, and I don't know, like I'm not Jesus, you know, I'm not, you know, a prophet, I'm not anyone special than other people out there, you know, and that's why I have a hard time, um, understanding a lot of what's going on and that's why I kind of came to these conclusions about maybe Jesus you know was in fact um, talking to a spiritual force and not to people you know anyway um, once more Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there look I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify, crucify. But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders insisted, We have a law. And according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the son of God. When Pilate heard this, and now we all claim to be the son of God or the daughter of God, God of the, the, the son of the father, the, of the daughter of the father, right? There's, um, there's a license plate that said, I am a princess to the father or something like that. I, I don't know. But anyway, but that was back at that time. They, I guess they weren't allowed to say that. Like different words weren't allowed to say today because people get, you know, offended easily. It could be race, racial. It could be um, not racial. You know, I don't even want to go there. You know, and it's, it's dumb. It's just a way of thinking, a mentality way of thinking. But anyway, I'm not even going to go there. But verse 8 says, when Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid. And went back inside the palace. Where do you, where do you come from? He asked Jesus. And remember, there's in in a actual. The devil goes up to and fro. See right here. Right here. Job 1 7. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth in it. See, so when Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, he went back inside that palace. And Pilate asked Jesus, Where do you come from? He answered he asked Jesus, but Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? See, so right here, Pilate is basically addressing his authority over Jesus' life. And Peter, I could read it again. Peter said, do you realize I have power to either free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, so this is probably like a demon speaking to him. 
And Jesus said, you have no power over me. If it were not given to you from above, therefore the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. Because what did um, Matthew's Um, no, yeah, Matthew's account say, put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword would die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put in at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that, that say it must happen in this way? See, so don't forget about that. Don't, don't forget about all this stuff. This is all stuff that Jesus said. And this is stuff that Jesus can still do. Because in the John account, um, they, they fell back. The, the, the people that went to to uh, arrest Jesus, Jesus, they, um, I think, I think it was this account or Luke, um, yeah, I think it was John, oh wait, I'm reading, oh no wonder, I'm reading, um, uh, What was I at? 